As we continue our study in this awesome book of Exodus, Moses is coming to the end of his 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai. He's been up there with God on top of the mountain. Uh, he received the Ten Commandments that we saw. He's been getting all this information about building the tabernacle and all the sacrifices and all the furniture and everything about the tabernacle. And so he's wrapping things up in his 40 days and 40 nights. And as we'll see, God has a couple more things uh, for Moses, a couple more instructions as it pertains to the building of the tabernacle and some important items that will be necessary for their worship to the Lord. And once again, everything about the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. We've been looking at that very closely as we've gone through all these different implements and items, furniture, it all points to Jesus. And he is the fulfillment of all that God is showing Moses. And these last few items are no exception. We see Jesus within all these things as well. And so the next and last item of furniture for the tabernacle is the bronze laver. Um, this is a large basin. It would hold water. It was used by the priests to wash their hands and their feet. When we get to chapter 38, it'll tell us that this was made from these highly polished bronze mirrors that the Israelite women took with them when they fled from Egypt. And so let's uh, read from chapter 30, starting in verse 17 is where we pick up this morning. Exodus 30, verse 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its bra uh, base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. You shall put water in it, uh, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the, uh, the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die, and it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his de descendants throughout their generations. So a few things that are interesting to take note of. Um, first of all, this is the only item within the entire tabernacle where we have no measurements given to Moses. I mean, everything else, the length of the tabernacle, the, the fencing was 150 feet by 75 feet. I mean, all the other implements and furniture, I mean, they were given precise measurements, how many cubits wide and tall and all those type of things. But here we don't have any diameter, circumference or height. You know, everything else, again, had exact measurements. Now, we do know this bronze laver stood between um, the, the altar where the, you know, the brass altar. Go ahead and put that up, uh, please. And the entrance into the holy place. So right in the very middle, you see that uh, looks red on this picture. That would be where the bronze laver stood. So if you're going from right into the left, you come through from the outer parts of the tabernacle. You come into the inner the, the courtyard. The very first thing, the big square thing, that's the altar of bronze that the sacrifice would take place. Uh, then you have the basin of water. And then you go into the holy place. On the right side, the top of the holy place is the uh, table of showbread. And then across from that is the uh, lampstand. And again, all these things that we talked about point to Jesus. And then uh, the little square next to the holy of holies is the altar of incense. You go through the veil and then you would enter into the holy of holies. Only the high priest could go in there once a year on the day of uh, atonement, Yom Kippur and be able to put the blood on the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And so you get another picture there. You can kind of see a little bit different. So you got the, uh, the, the bronze altar where they'd sacrifice the animals and then the round basin of water. And so that's what we're looking at here. And before they offered up a sacrifice upon the bronze altar, the priests had to wash their hands. They had to wash their feet. And then before they could enter into the tabernacle itself, they had to wash their hands and wash their feet. God took this so seriously that if the priest didn't do this, they would be dead. And so this is very important. Now, this is another picture of the sanctification process that we are all going through. 
In other words, if you are born again today, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are a new creation in Christ, you are justified, that means you're declared righteous by God Almighty Himself. How is that possible? Because when God the Father looks upon you, He sees God the Son living in you. He sees Jesus, and that's why you are declared righteous. So, that is our position in Christ. That position does not change. But until we get to heaven, and until we receive our resurrection glorified bodies, we are currently in the sanctification process. That means none of us are perfect yet. I know that's hard for some of you to realize, that you're not perfect yet. But I get disappointed all the time. Look in the mirror, and it's like, yeah, long way to go. And that's how we all are. We're still in process. We are saved. We are accepted in the Beloved. We're forgiven of all of our sins. But again, we are still far from perfect because we're still living in these fleshly human carcasses that we're dragging around and as we dwell in this sinful world. And so these priests, as they prepared themselves for ministry. They had to wash their hands and they had to wash their feet. Again, this is what Jesus was doing with the disciples after he instituted the Lord's Supper. We're told this in John 13. Check out these verses. You're familiar with this. He's washing their feet. Why? Because he's preparing them for service, for ministry. It says... After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? You know, because that was a very, very humbling thing for Jesus to do. You wash somebody's feet, that was the lowest position of a servant. And so, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Now, you don't want to tell Jesus never, but Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And as is typical of Peter, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but notice is completely clean. You are clean. You know, you're you're clean, Peter, but you need your feet washed because you live in a dirty world, and we need our feet washed, spiritually speaking, from time to time. And then he says, but not all of you. He's speaking of Judas Iscariot there. And so if we want to be serving the Lord more effectively, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and allow him to wash our feet, spiritually speaking. In other words, Jesus doesn't want us to be serving him with dirty hearts, with filthy minds, Otherwise, our service to him will be nothing but hay, wood, and straw. What do you mean, Jeff? Well, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another, that would be you and me, builds on it. But let each one take heed... In other words, be careful how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. That's when we all, as believers, stand before the Bema seat of Christ. And that's where we will be rewarded or not rewarded for what we've done as Christians when we stand before him. And he says, because it will be revealed by fire, the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. So what do you think passes through the fire? Well, the gold, silver, precious stones. What burns up? The hay, wood, and stubble. That's the things we do as Christians in the flesh, things that aren't pleasing to the Lord. They'll just be burned up. There'll be a pile of ashes. My goal is for you to have the smallest pile of ashes when we get to heaven. You know, I mean, a lot of us, I'm sure, all have a big pile of ashes, things we've done where we wanted the praise, we wanted the, you know, to have the applause of men or whatever it is, but God wants our hearts to be pure. So we need to allow him to work these things into our lives today. So you'll receive a reward, but if anyone's work is burned up, again, the hay, wood, straw, he suffers loss, but he himself will be saved, 
yet so as through fire. So again, the Lord wants us to be serving him with a clean heart, pure mind, with right motives. And so this washing that we're talking about is so that we can serve the Lord more effectively. We need to allow the Lord to periodically cleanse our hearts, renew our minds, you know, strengthen us, encourage us, refresh our soul, our spirit. And the Lord does this for you and I as believers in three very important ways. If you're taking notes, this is where you want to start writing something down because we have these three very amazing ways that the Lord works in our lives, refreshing us, cleansing us, purifying our hearts and minds as Christians. So I'm not talking about un unbelievers here. So first of all, we know that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. When we were saved, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. His blood has washed us clean, washed all of our sins away. But according to 1 John 1, 7, it tells us the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us of all sin. It's in the present tense. So yes, we're once and for all clean by the blood of the Lamb, but He continually cleanses us. And then in this verse, 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, not only does the blood of Jesus wash away all of our sins when we are justified by God at the moment of our salvation, but when we get, up, uh, get caught up in something that's not pleasing to the Lord, have you ever done something that you thought, oh, this wasn't good? This thought wasn't right? I mean, yes, of course we all have. But when we get caught up in these things, it's not pleasing to the Lord. When we humble ourselves before God, the blood of Jesus will wash us clean once again. And so we don't have to live in condemnation. We don't have to go around, oh, God will never use me. I blew it again. No, we allow his blood to continually cleanse us of all sin. And that's not for getting resaved, by the way, but it's for a healthier relationship with the Lord. Jesus is the groom. We're the bride of Christ. He doesn't want anything getting between you and him. He doesn't want anything messing up that relationship. And there's so many things in this world that are trying to vie for your attention and your heart, and it's going to cause you to drift away. But Jesus says, no, I want that first love relationship with you. Even as he tells the church of Ephesus, Ephesus there in um, Revelation 2.4. Anyway, so that's the first thing. The blood of Christ cleanses us of all sin, past tense but is cleansing us as well. Secondly, we see a similar pattern in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is often referred to as living water. When we came to Jesus for salvation, he filled us with his Holy Spirit. Remember when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman there, Jacob's well, and we read this in John 4, verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water, talking about the well water, will thirst again. And you can put anything in there. Whoever drinks from this, whatever you think is going to satisfy you in this world, it won't. It'll leave you empty, thirsting for more. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You know, a few verses earlier, Jesus called this, the living water. And so here Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit in his role of salvation. Whoever drinks of the polluted waters of this world will never be satisfied. You will thirst again. And I've seen so many Christians over the years, they think they can go back to some of these practices that God saved them from, and it leaves them empty, it leaves them discouraged, it leaves them beat up and bruised, because the material things, the fleshly things of this world will never give you what you really need, what you truly desire. You will always end up dry and desperate and thirsty for something else. John chapter 7, verse 37 we read, on the last day, that great day of the feast, this is the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 
But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And that would take place in the day of Pentecost. So here, the living water of the Holy Spirit speaks of our salvation experience. And I don't know about you, but what love, what joy flooded my heart on November 30th, 1977, when I got saved. I mean, I went from darkness to light, from death to life in that blink of an eye. I mean, it was such a radical conversion in my life, and the Lord just flooded me. And I just knew at that moment that all my sins were washed away. He gave me the free gift of eternal life. I couldn't explain all the doctrines or theology, but I just knew Jesus was now my Lord and Savior. And it was amazing. But now that we are saved, Jesus still wants us to be filled and then refilled with his Holy Spirit. It's not just a one-time experience. Yes, at the moment of salvation, you're signed, sealed, and delivered by the Spirit into the body of Christ. He never leaves us, but we need to be refilled. After all, since we are still far from perfect, there may be times in our lives when we are not experiencing the rivers of living water. You might not even be experiencing the streams in the desert. You might just be a little drip, drip, drip coming out of your life. Uh, it's happened to me. The Apostle Paul addresses this in Ephesians 4 and 5. First, he warns about all the things that Christians can get caught up with in our flesh. And then Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, by getting caught up in things of the world starting to think wrongly, starting to do things that are not pleasing to the Lord. That grieves the Spirit. He's in us. He won't leave us or forsake us, but we don't want to you know, put on those things. We want to put those things off, Paul says, and don't give Satan an opportunity to rip you off because he loves to. Paul gives us a solution. Look at this verse, Ephesians 5.18. You're familiar with this. Do not be drunk with wine or anything. Don't get high on whatever, which is dissipation. That means wastefulness. But, he says, be filled with the Spirit. And again, Paul, when he says be filled, it literally means be being filled. Continually be filled. I love when they ask D.L. Moody, why do you keep talking about being refilled? Because I leak, he said. And we do. In a sense, we leak. So we need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord to open up the floodgates of the Holy Spirit once again. Jesus wants us to experience those rivers of living water. And so we have the blood, we have the Holy Spirit. What's the third way we're cleansed? Again, we're talking about the bronze laver for washing. Well, it's the Word of God. The Word of God is so important. Again, the Word of God was vital as it pertained to our salvation, specifically the proclaiming of the gospel it was what the Lord used, the gospel, the word of God, that convicted us of our sins as the Holy Spirit showed us, you're a sinner, you need Jesus. He convicted us of sin, righteousness, judgment. But it was through the word of God that we realized, I need Christ. That's why Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first, and also for us Greeks or Gentiles. What's the gospel? Well, Paul tells us very simply, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's first and foremost. He's the sacrificial Lamb of God. He shed His blood for all of our sins. First and foremost, He died for our sins. And He was buried. We saw that last time where we looked at you know, Joseph of Arimathea. Nick at night, Nicodemus, they take Jesus off the cross. They give him a proper burial. He was as dead as could be. But then last Sunday, we talked about the resurrection of Christ. That's what he says. And the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. And so now that we are saved by simply believing and trusting the gospel, the good news concerning Jesus Christ, 
and his substitutionary sacrificial death for our sins and the fact that he conquered the grave and rose from the dead, now that we are saved, the living and powerful word of God is so important for us to read and heed and hold fast to. Why is this important? Because the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to cleanse our hearts and to renew our minds and to remind us of the promises God has for us. Because again, you're going to hear so many different things from the world. You just spend a couple hours watching Fox News or CNN News or any of those broadcasts out there, and you're going to go away mad. And you're going to get ticked off. And you're going to be, oh, this world's blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and the Lord says, no, come back to my word. I'll explain where you are and what you need to be focusing on. He uses the word to refresh our souls. He uses it to convict us. When we start to stray from his plans, his purposes for our lives. Again, he uses the word of God to remind us of his love for us. He reminds us that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. He reminds us what Jesus says. I'm with you always to the end of this age. Because there's times when you'll be like, oh man, I don't know if I can keep going on. I don't know if God still loves me. So we need to be in the word of God. And there are many scriptures that speak of this cleansing power of God's word. For example, look at these verses. You're familiar with this. Psalm 119, starting in verse 9, it says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Again, the word of God. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I mean, one of my favorite verses, you know, dealing with the cleansing power of God's word, it's in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 25. This is where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as, <laughs> just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And you're thinking, that's impossible. How can I love my wife the exact same way? That's what it means. Love your wife the exact same way Jesus loves you, unconditionally, sacrificially with his agape love. That's why we have to go to him to receive the love that we need. So then he says in verse 26, that he, Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse her, that's us, with the washing of the water by the word. And so that's one of the great ministries of Jesus. He washes us in the water of the word of God. He cleanses our hearts he renews our minds as he works on us from the inside out. And Jesus uses the word of God to combat the lies of the enemy who's constantly trying to tell you and me, God doesn't want to use you. You've blown it again. This is too far beyond, you know, forgiveness or whatever he might say. You know, God doesn't care about you anymore. Don't listen to that mud-slinging liar any longer. Let the word of God wash over you. Hold fast to the promises of God's word. And I will say I am thankful for all of my brothers and sisters who give their counsel and advice, who speak truth into my life. But there is no substitute for the word of God. There's no substitute. There's no substitute for the Holy Spirit using the word of God because then I receive from God his peace, his encouragement, his strength, you know, his conviction, whatever it is, his power to do whatever he's called me to do. And whenever you're facing those daily battles, you need to be in the word of God. Don't, and I had a guy years ago, um, I don't know if he got saved or not. He said he did. So that's between him and the Lord. And he said, yeah, I took about six months off. I read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I said, that's great. And he goes, yeah, but now what? He didn't understand anything he read. He just read through it. Thought, okay, now I've read the Bible. I guess I'm good. And he just fell back into his old ways because he thought, that's it. Just read the book. No, it's the Holy Spirit of God that takes the word of God that transforms the people of God. How is it that God's word can do all these things in our lives? Because this is God's word. It's not man's opinion. You'll hear that from the world. Oh, this is just a bunch of old people writing these things down, and it's all contradictory, and they can find all the... No, you can't. This is God's word from Genesis to Revelation, period. It's his living word. It's unlike no other book. 
You know, the Mormons, they say, oh, we've got all these extra books in addition to the Bible. That's not God's word. Those are man's word. Joseph Smith drawing these little things out of a hat and coming up with the Book of Mormon. Are you kidding me? And it contradicts the Bible. M most of it is plagiarized from the Bible. For all these places, people, rivers, battles in the Book of Mormon, they've never found one shred of archaeological evidence for. And they still got teams. They started here. They went down into Mexico. Now they're in South America still looking for stuff to back up the Book of Mormon. You go to Israel. You stick a shovel in the ground. Oh, there it is. First Kings chapter whatever. I mean, the Bible is constantly being confirmed by, you know, science and everything else. Archaeology, prophecy above and, you know, anything. I mean, Joseph Smith had over 100 prophecies. Zero came true. What does that make him? False prophet. You miss one, they would stone you to death. So pretty obvious. This is God's living word alone from Genesis to Revelation. Hebrews 4, verse 12 tells us, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. There's a lot of people say, oh, there's no such thing as a division between soul and spirit. We're just body and soul. No, the Bible says we are body, soul, and spirit. We're created in the image and likeness of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're that triune being as well. We have a body, and that body, when Adam was created, was perfect. But when he sinned, he went upside down. He went from having that spiritual relationship with the Father to now his body is ruling, his soul is there, his intellect, suke, your mind, and then a spirit died because God said, the day you eat of this forbidden fruit, you will surely die. He died, not physically, but spiritually he died. So this is why Jesus says, you must be born again. And then it gets reversed back. Now we have this spiritual relationship with the Lord. We still have our minds, our intellect. And then we have our body, which we need to put in subjection to the Lord, but it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. No other book can do this. Only God's Word. Now, as I said earlier, this bronze labor was made from these highly polished mirrors that the Israelite women brought out of Egypt, and it wouldn't surprise me at all when the priests would you know, get ready to wash their hands and their feet. They would look into this and they would see their reflection, their own reflection in the water. Again, what a picture of what the Word of God can do in our lives. God's Word reveals who we really are. It reminds me of how weak I am in and of myself, but it also reminds me that I can be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It causes us to think about our priorities in life. Listen to these words from... Uh, James, uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's God's word. You look into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. In other words, as we spend time in God's word, we should be changed and transformed. And that was a Pastor Chuck thing. He used to always say, you know, it's the, the Holy Spirit of God takes the word of God and transforms the people of God. And it's an ongoing work with the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. So that's it for all the furnishings of the tabernacle. We've got a couple more things to look at here quickly. We have these recipes that God gives Moses, and two very important recipes that must be followed very carefully. The first one is the holy anointing oil, and then the next one is the holy incense. Look at verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of cassia, 
according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil, about six quarts of olive oil. And you shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony, the table, that's the showbread, and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its base. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it according to its composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off. That means put to death, cut off from his people. Again, this is God's recipe for the anointing oil. This recipe needed to be followed exactly as God lays it out. This anointing oil recipe would be followed for about 1,500 years from this moment here all the way until the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD. This oil would be used to anoint not only the priests later, they would anoint the prophets with this oil. They would anoint the kings with this oil. Now, Jesus is ultimately the one who fulfills this because he's the ultimate prophet. He's the final high priest, and he is the king of kings. He fulfilled this because he received the final anointing. Not with the oil, but with the Holy Spirit. This is why the Bible refers to Jesus as the anointed one. By the way, since we are joint heirs with Christ, we have been anointed by the Holy Spirit as well. Check out these verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 20. It says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen. In other words, when God gives you a promise in his word, you can bank on it to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And so even as God gave Moses his recipe for the holy anointing oil, God has anointed us with his Holy Spirit. The word anointed simply means consecrated or made sacred. And when a person was anointed, it meant they were fully dedicated to God. Again, Jesus is the, uh, the ultimate anointed one. He was fully dedicated to doing the Father's will, speaking the Father's word. This is what Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 18. Jesus is quoting himself from Isaiah 61, but he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is what the anointing is for in your life today as well. This is why he's anointed you with the Holy Spirit, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Again, the same anointing is for all of us today. 1 John 2.27, it says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. In other words, the anointing we have in the Holy Spirit allows us to know the Word of God, to understand the Word of God, and then to live out the Word of God. Be doers, not hearers only. Now, this is very important as it pertains to this 
holy anointing oil. God is very clear that this oil had to be made in a very specific way, and it had to be used only for the anointing uh, of the tabernacle, its furniture, the priests who ministered in the tabernacle, period. It could not be brought into anybody's home. It could not be poured out on any stranger, it says. And here God says it was punishable by death. In other words, this was not some common fragrance that you could use around your house or cover up this stink in your tent. You, you, that's what Yankee candles are for. That, that's why you have those things in your bathroom, right? You could not use this. God had a very specific recipe by which to make this anointing oil. And there was no room for changing things up. Years ago, we had probably 20 years ago now, we had this guy who was a self-proclaimed prophet, and he claimed that he had made this anointing oil. And Aaron and I were like, oh, back up. You know, you're don't do that. It tells you you'll be, you'll be put to death for this. Unfortunately, human nature thinks that we can help God out. And so we might start adding ingredients, we might start taking different ingredients away. We might substitute different ingredients. But as we've seen throughout our study in the book of Exodus, God says what he means, and he means what he says. In other words, when it comes to the anointing oil, which represents the Holy Spirit, there is a specific recipe that God has laid out for us. His word tells us all that we need to know about the Holy Spirit he is the third member of the eternal triune Godhead. And so we don't tell him what to do or how to do it. We don't say the Holy Spirit's in my jacket and wave it around and try to knock people down. That is not of the Holy Spirit. But we are to yield our lives over to him and let him work in us. Let him work through us. God has given us the recipe for a victorious Christian life. And again, it's all laid out for us in the Bible. It's not all that complicated. There's an anointing that comes when we are in a right relationship with God. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live a life that brings glory and honor to Him. He, he anoints us so that people can see Jesus at work in us and through us. But then there are a lot of Christians that are constantly struggling they have no power. They have no joy. They're constantly stumbling and giving into their flesh. And a lot of times my question is, are you following the recipe? Are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Have you placed your faith alone in Christ alone? Or are you still thinking you have to try to prove yourself to God? Don't try to prove yourself to God. He knows who you are, and you can't do anything apart from Christ. Are you spending time with the Lord in prayer by reading his word, being in fellowship? He's given us the very simple, basic ingredient, Acts 2.42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the word of God and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Keep it simple, saints. That's the KISS approach. Keep it simple. We know the recipe, and we, we come to the Lord with humility and brokenness. We turn from our sin, and we simply walk with Jesus. There are always people who want to add to God's Word or take away from God's Word, and they wonder why they're having so many struggles and issues in their life. And if I say, well, how's your devotional life doing? That's usually a good indication because, well, you know, I don't read the Bible very often. Are you spending time in the Word? Well, no, not really. Is the Word washing over you? I don't know what that means. Are you putting off the old man and putting on the new? And they'll a lot of times say something to the effect of, don't give me that ingredient. You know, there's got to be more than the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. No, there isn't. There's not. When Peter says that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that means he's given us all that we need in our relationship with Jesus through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. We can live in victory in this broken, sinful world. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It means it's God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to believe that this is God's holy word, and we need to ask the Lord to give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. After all, this is our spiritual food. There's no substitute for God's word. There's a lot of good devotional books out there. That's fine, but don't let that become a substitute for God's word. Let's wrap it up here. Look at verse 34. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacti, anica. I'm just making this. I don't know how to pronounce these things. Galbanum and pure frankincense. I love it because when I've gone to Israel, I ask me, how do you pronounce that word? And I'm like, okay. Great. I don't know what you said, but that's good. And pure frankincense with these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. Okay, again, this is for the altar of the incense. That was the only thing that could be burned on the altar of incense. We saw last time they could not burn any sacrifices on that little altar. Only this. You shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle. This is right up against the veil there in the tabernacle uh, of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense, which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it, to smell it, <laughs> he shall be cut off from his people. So again, the same thing we said about the anointing oil is true for this incense. No deviations from God's recipe. It was only to be used in the altar of incense. And both of these recipes, they put off a beautiful aroma. And so here's Aaron, the high priest, and he hasn't even done this yet. I mean, this will all get laid out later on. But this is the instructions of what Aaron and his sons will do. But these things would put off a beautiful aroma. And these guys working with this stuff, they would smell amazing. They, they would just walk through the congregation. They'd be like, wow, doesn't that smell good? And it was a sweet aroma. It was to draw them to the Lord. It's not a stinky stench or like, oh, I don't want to be around them. But this was a beautiful aroma, fragrance, this oil. It reminded the people of the beauty and the goodness of the Lord. It didn't drive people away, but it was meant to draw them in. And the same is true for you and me today. It's only because we are in a relationship with God that we are putting off the fragrance of Jesus. Look at these verses. It says in 2 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one... We are the aroma of death leading to death. That's why a lot of unbelievers think, you stink. Stop telling me about Jesus. To the other, the aroma of life leading to life. Who is sufficient for these things? You, you, you know, when I go to India and you're in different countries and you're around believers and you don't even know they're believers at first, but it doesn't take very long you realize this guy's a believer. This gal's a believer. They know Jesus. I mean, they just put off that fragrance of, of life. And you can just, you know, try to fake it. You can try to copy it. But most people will see right through it if you do. And then they'll say, you're just a hypocrite. You tell me this, but you're living like that. I don't want to listen. But there's an anointing, there's a power that only comes when we are walking in that close relationship with Jesus, and that is what it all boils down to. God wants us to draw close to Him. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to cast all our cares upon Him. So put up that picture of the courtyard once again, the tabernacle. God doesn't want you just staying in the outer court. What's in the outer court? That's the altar of judgment. A lot of people just like to hang around there. They're always judging everybody, and they're always talking about judgment. 
The judgment refers to that altar, that altar of bronze. That was where the sacrifice took place. We already saw that represents the cross of Christ. We don't just hang out at the cross. Jesus isn't on the cross. He's off the cross. Then you go to the, the laver. Jesus is washing us of all of our sins. Then you go through that first curtain there. And what's on the right side? The table of showbread. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Come to me. You'll never hunger again. What's on the other side? On the bottom, you can barely see it. It's the lampstand. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And then as you move towards the, the Holy of Holies, you got that altar of incense. What does that represent? Again, Jesus is interceding for us. As that smoke from this incense went up, it represented the prayers of the people before the Lord. The veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies, what happened when Jesus died on the cross? As soon as he said, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit, the veil in the temple torn in two from top to bottom, giving us access into the very throne room of God's grace. And what's there? His throne. That's what the mercy seat represents, the Ark of the Covenant. We're under the new covenant. We have that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all a picture of heaven, as, as we've talked about before. God is giving Moses the blueprints of what heaven is really like. So we read this in Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That word boldly simply means confidently. We confidently come before him because he's done all the work on our behalf. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And so we don't have to jump through all these hoops like the Old Testament saints did with all these laws and rules and rituals. We don't have to do all these things to come into the presence of God. Today we have been given access into the presence of God through our personal relationship with his only begotten son, Jesus. And don't ever take that for granted. Jesus has given us all that we need for life and godly living. And it's all found in his recipe, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God.